Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the second meeting. How was your day? Tired faces? A lot of tired faces. So, we're going to continue from where we left off last time, where we installed this. So, Ubuntu, more precisely, Kubuntu. So, with the KD desktop environment, the way we called it. So, today, because last time I spent about half of the meeting talking about software, today we're going to spend the entire meeting talking about software. Because software is interesting. Your computer doesn't do a whole lot without the software on it. You're not really going to enjoy any operating system without the software on it. So we're going to split this meeting mostly into three parts. First of all, I want to talk about the software that you have from the beginning when you install this specific uh, Ubuntu with the KD desktop environment. So uh, the software that I'm going to be talking about in this part is generally going to be applicable to any distribution that uses the KDE desktop environment. Other desktop environments will come with their own bundled apps. But you will always find apps that do the same thing that I'm talking about. They might just be called different and have some different settings and stuff like that. But they're going to have the same functionality at the end of the day. Then I want to talk a bit about how we install new applications. I talked a bit about this in like a theoretical level last time, but now I want to show a bit the differences between, for example, the distro repositories that we talked about and the universal repositories and stuff. Because I said there's two types, but I never really mentioned what are the upsides or downsides of whichever one you decide to use. And then for the third part, we're going to be trying to get some Windows software to run. Because a lot of people are used to their Windows software and they would like to keep it running, right? Uh, especially for games, that's going to be true. You're not really going to find any games on Linux. But you are going to be able to make quite a few Windows games work on Linux. So that's the general structure for today. We have these three major parts. So we have the machine here. It's in the same state that we left last time. I didn't do anything to it. The only thing I did is I did install OBS here, which is also running right now. This is a screen capturing utility, basically. We'll be using this to record the video. You can pretend that it doesn't exist, right? Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the settings. So generally speaking, on any operating system, you're going to have a lot of settings. In this case, the settings on Linux are probably not going to give you a whole lot more customization than Windows would. But uh, on KDE in particular, you will notice that there are a lot of menus. And if we go into any of these menus, what we will find is a lot of submenus, which is really intimidating. So this in particular is not an artifact of Linux. Linux doesn't have to be intimidating but we chose to install the KDE desktop environment. Why? Because I like it. Now, the part of the philosophy, I guess, behind KDE is they always want to give you a lot of choice. So all of the KDE applications will have a lot of options and a lot of settings, and you can customize a lot of stuff. And that can be a little bit intimidating, and they are a bit hard to navigate. Now, they have slightly fixed this issue as of two days ago, a new major version was released. We now have KDE 6. We are still running KDE 5 here though, because Ubuntu doesn't have KDE 6 yet. So we're stuck on the old version for now. Now, obviously I don't want to go through the entire settings because that would be an hour and a half on its own. The only thing is, First of all, we have a bunch of appearance settings, right? So this is the same as in your Windows. In your Windows, you have the personalization, I think it's called, tab in settings, where you have all of your teams and stuff. Now, the main difference on KDE in particular is that you also have this little get new global themes thingy. So they have a store for your themes, basically. If we go into here, we'll notice that there are a lot of ways you can make your system look. 
out of the first page, three of them are just going to be copies of Windows because some people want to make them look like Windows, right? But if we look at them and we look at the screenshots, they do look like Windows. So you can install a bunch of different themes. We're not going to go into that today, but I do want to get a dark mode. Maybe. I actually don't know. Is the dark mode going to look OK on the projector? Does that look fine? I can't really see it a lot. Would you prefer a white mode? We'll keep it like this then. If at any point you can't see something because it's too dark, just let me know and we'll switch. So the other thing that I would like to change is um, I don't know how you guys are used to using laptops because I don't remember what the default is on Windows. But you have a choice between either having to click on the touchpad to select something or just tap it, right? So you don't have to actually click on it. Now, I don't know what the default on uh, Windows is. On KDE, the default is to have to click on it. And I just don't really like that. So we'll go to Input Devices, Touchpad, and I just want to enable Tap to Click. Cool. So as I said, I'm not going to go through all of the settings. I just, it's just interesting that there's a lot of options. One feature that I do want to highlight, because I find it interesting, and maybe you will as well. Windows has some analog to this, but I really don't get how it works on Windows. It's very confusing. Is the idea of virtual desktops. So we have one screen right now, right? We have a screen and a projector, but I am mirroring the same screen. So we only get one output. The idea of virtual desktops is if I go into here and I add a few more virtual desktops, right? So let's do three of them. Now we can see down here in the bottom left that there is these like three uh, rectangles. So the reason I want to show this is because this is a very common feature in almost any Linux distribution. And it's also common on Mac OS, if I remember correctly, which is that now if you click on them, it's almost like switching to another fake screen. So this is just really useful for having multiple apps open for multitasking instead of having to alt tap through apps, especially if you have shortcuts. So from KDE, I think it should be a Windows control and then the numbers. No. Is it? Let's figure it out. So if we go to the settings, we can go to shortcuts. Now, this is one of the thing that, things that you don't really see on Windows that much. You can customize, I think, any keybind on KDE or usually on almost any Linux in general. Basically, any keybind can be customized. So if we want to know how to switch to a different desktop, we can just search desktop. And if we look into here, we have uh, switch to desktop one. So it's control plus F1. So if I do that, yeah. So now you can switch to different desktops. That's useful generally if you want to like research something and take notes at the same time or stuff. I find it that it's easier instead of having to alt tab. And then if you alt tab to the wrong app, then you no longer know where to app, alt tab and stuff. You have to find it. It's easier to have a mental image of like, OK, my, uh, my web browser is on the first desktop. My note taking app is on the second desktop. My whatever is on the third desktop. And then you know exactly where to jump. There's a bunch of features like this. But again, I'm not going to go through everything because that's a lot. KD has a lot of features. Now, the first thing to talk a little bit about is the way files work. So we have here the file explorer, right? We can see in the top that it's called Dolphin because Linux likes naming everything. On Windows, this is just File Explorer, I think it's called. So first of all, the layout itself kind of looks familiar to Linux. It functions in to win <laughs> kind of looks familiar to Windows. It works in mostly the same way, where on the left, you will have your pinned places and stuff. Now I haven't pinned any places. And your different hard drives and stuff in the computer. And then on the right, you have your files themselves. Except in classic KDE fashion, we have a bunch more features. 
So this can, for example, split if you need to look into two folders at the same time and like drag and drop something or things like that. I'm not going to do it right now. But you can have uh, splits or anything like that. The settings also just have a lot of stuff. But one kind of important thing to remember, because I don't think this is the same on uh, Windows, this is just a Unix thing in general, is this show hidden files toggle. So you can have hidden files on Windows, don't get me wrong, but they work a bit differently on Linux. So if we go into my home directory, right, and we enable hidden files, we can see a bunch more folders and stuff. Now, the thing to remember with Linux to not shoot yourself in the foot and lose your files, well, like lose the ability to find them, I mean, is you'll notice that all of the hidden files and stuff start with a dot. So it's dot cache, dot config, dot local, etc. That's because on Linux, and I think on any Unix-based system, so I think macOS as well, but I'm not sure about that, if you start a file or a folder with a dot, that automatically means to make it hidden. And it's the only way to make a file hidden. So I think KD is even going to give us a warning. If I try to create a folder and I want to call it dot data, yeah, it's going to tell me that the name dot data starts with a dot, it will be hidden by default. So that's the way hidden files work. As far as general, let's call it multimedia usage, you have all of the same pre-installed things you would have on Windows. So if you have a video file, it should just work out of the box. Yeah, it does. I'll have to turn down my volume. You don't need to install anything to view video files or stuff. In fact, this is VLC. Does anyone use VLC? Yeah, two people. Okay. So VLC is also pretty popular on Windows. This is a and on Android. This is just available on all platforms. But you also have applications for viewing photos, documents, and anything like that. With the classic KD twist of having a lot of options for everything. In that regard, we do have what Windows calls Notepad, in a way. So we have a text editor, but it's not fully analogous. So if you look at the text editor in here, by the way, you can just search for text editor, even though that's not what it's called. You can see it's called Kate somewhere, but it says below it like advanced text editor. I just realized the projector is a bit cut to the left of the screen. I don't think there should be anything important there. I also can't fix it, so it is what it is. If we open Kate though, it looks a bit different than Notepad. Basically, to those familiar, it will look maybe more similar to like Visual Studio Code or something, because this is almost a IDE. It's almost a fully integrated development environment. So if we look to the left, we have stuff like Git integration and stuff in it. If I create a file, uh, if I save the file, let's call it something like program.py, so a Python file, right? Then it's going to know it's a Python file, and if I do something like this, right, you can see that, let's make it a bit bigger, you can see that it has syntax highlighting and stuff, so it works more similar to VS Code than it would to Notepad. It's the same thing, but just with a bunch more features. Now, the one thing I don't think you'll find by default is uh, an analogous application to Paint. Do you use Paint in Windows? So, the only real time I use Paint in Windows is if I want to take some quick notes or something, because I have a drawing uh, tablet to take notes with. You can get an application that is developed by KDE that's supposed to be an alternative to Paint. But that's Krita. It's the thing that we installed last time at the end of the lecture, which was developed by KDE, and it is supposed to take the place of Paint, but in functionality, it's closer to like Photoshop or something. So this is a full drawing utility. If I create a file, you can see that 
unlike uh, paint, if you look in the bottom right, we have brushes and stuff, we have a bunch of layers, you have almost anything you would have in Photoshop or something. So that's basically what it is when it comes to pre-installed apps with KDE. Now, you do also get an Office Suite. So people coming from Windows will probably be used to using the Microsoft Office Suite, if, especially if you have a license. Or actually, we got a license from UVT, so I guess we all have a license. But uh, you don't get the Microsoft Office Suite on Linux because Microsoft doesn't develop a lot for Linux for obvious reasons. But if we do look into the Start menu, which I will look, you will not look very much because it's a bit cut, but you can see that there is an Office uh, category on the left. And if you look in it, it comes pre-installed with LibreOffice. So this is going to be an alternative to Microsoft Office that's going to have maybe 90% compatibility. There are some stuff that the Microsoft apps can do that these can't and the other way around. But generally speaking, you will be able to open any Office file in these, maybe with some very small styling not working properly, as you would open it in Google Slides. Because if you've tried in the past, if you open like a Microsoft Office, a PPTX or something, if you open it in uh, Google Slides, it's going to have some of the fonts messed up and stuff, sometimes. Same thing here. Sometimes it's just not going to fully work. But if we do open something interface-wise, it's going to look similar to um, Office 2016. Who's used Office 2016? Office 2013, Office 27. All of those kind of have the same interface. So the current, like, what's it called? Like Office uh, 365, the current offering, has a slightly redesigned interface. But these are going to look the same as the older ones with the big menus at the top and stuff. So you do get an Office suite. Now, what do we do when it comes to installing new apps? And again, we're going to be installing new apps without using the terminal because for this entire meeting, I'll try not to use the terminal. We have a separate meeting for that, which is going to be fun. But first of all, do I have internet in this room? I do. I have Edge Realm. That's cool. So last time, I showed you this software center, app center, I call it, I think. If we look at the top, it's called Discover. That's how the one on uh, KDE is called. You will have an application like this, no matter what desktop environment you're on. They might just be called different. On GNOME, it's GNOME software or stuff like that. Now, remember last time when we talked about how there are distribution-specific repositories and there's some universal repositories that can work on any distribution. The cool part about KDE's Discover is it actually works with all of them. So you have this one singular place where you can install from any source. Now, on Ubuntu, uh, I said in the past that there are two main universal package managers. There is Snap and there is Flatpak. You don't need to remember the names. But Snap is pre-enabled on Ubuntu because it's developed by the team behind Ubuntu. So they kind of enable it themselves. For Flatpak, it's nothing complicated. If you go to the settings and you scroll a bit, I think. Yeah. At the back, you see we have some missing backends and we have a Flatpak backend. So if we just click install on that, it's going to ask us for our password. And after a quick second, or a longer second, yeah, we're going to have it installed. Now, if you scroll back to the top and you don't see it, close Discover. Open Discover again. Sometimes it needs to refresh a bit. Now, if you go into Settings again, you'll see that we have this new Flatpak category. But we have this dash here. That means for Flatpak, we have no sources. So let me open Kate since we already talked about it because I don't, yeah, I don't have a whiteboard to write on, so I'll write on my computer. Remember how last time I talked about the idea that we have a package format, right, 
we have a uh, how did I do it yeah uh, no let's start with a package manager we have a package format and we have the sources the repository the whatever so where is grabbing it from right now when it comes to snap all of this is together you can't really separate them so the manager the command that you would run when we start learning about commands the command is just called snap the format is a snap and the source is snapcraft and you cannot get any other sources so this is one thing that snap is somewhat criticized of in the linux community people are used to be able to putting multiple sources snap doesn't allow that so this snapcraft this is a server from the creators of ubuntu and the creators of snap and it's also closed source this is not open source so you cannot see what that server does you cannot host your own copy of it or anything like that this in its way works very very close to the google play store where all of the apps in the play store are just held by google and when you upload an app to the google play store it does some automatic uh, malware checks and stuff like that same way with snap now Flatpak is very little bit different because you have the Flatpak manager, Flatpak, the Flatpak manager and format. So that's still the same thing, right? But for the sources, you can have anything. So there is a official source that is from the creators of Flatpak and that is Flathub. But you can also put any other source you want. So this server component, Flathub, that's open source and anyone can just copy it and they can make their own server on which they host their own applications if they don't want to put it on Flathub. Now, in reality, 90% of stuff is just going to be on Flathub. So let's enable it. If we go into the settings again, we'll notice that Flatpak is so common that we actually have a button for this. So we have an add source button where we can add whatever repository we want. But because Flathub is so popular, we can just click add Flathub and it's going to ask for our password and that's just going to enable it by default. Now, you'll see that it's not enabling it because we need to close Discover and open it again. <laughs> that's just how Discover works. Whenever you do anything, you have to restart the application. But now, if we look for an app that I know is only available in Flathub, so for example, if I look for bottles, I can see the application. And if I click on it and I see at distributed by it's a central repository of flatpak applications long name for flathub as i said is the official repository so that's how that works right now the question is what if we want to install an app that we can grab from any source we want right so let's go for um Let's look on the main page here. What's VLC available in? Okay, so I have VLC already installed, but this is the video playing app that I talked about. But when an app is available in multiple sources, you can see we have a new button at the top right of the screen, which says sources. If you click on it, we see that this one is actually available in all places. So we can grab it from the Ubuntu repository. That's the distribution specific one. Or we can grab it as a snap or as a flat pack. So, why would we do any of these, right? Does anyone already have an intuition of why some might be better, like what the advantages and disadvantages might be? Well, a clear advantage of the universal one is that it's universal. So, if you have an app and you're used to it, you can install it on any, on any distribution you want. But, let's talk a bit about how these things work behind the scenes. So, Let's say I want to install two applications. I want to install the application A and I want to install the application B, okay? And both of these applications, to function properly, they need to have the application C installed. So A and B are both going to depend on C, right? If you do this through your own distribution-specific package manager, generally speaking, what it's going to do is when you install A, right, it's going to go 
I need C, install C, right? It's going to grab it automatically for you. Now, later down the line, when I want to install B, it's going to once again go, I need C, but then it's going to go, I, all, I already have C, because we already installed it in the previous step. So it can now skip it. So when you're using your own distribution-specific package manager, uh, sort of applications are going to be shared between one another. The advantage of this is that it takes not a lot of space. It's sufficient on space, because both of these did not have to install C two separate times, right? The disadvantage of this is, what if A says, I need C at version 20. I need the 20th version of C. Then it's going to install C20. And that's all good so far. It gets more complicated, though, if now B comes along and says, I need C19. Because when it's going to look for it and it's going to try to install C19, it's going to realize that it already has a newer version of C. And it's usually not going to like that. And it's usually not going to work. Now, this is not a big deal in this case, necessarily, because it's just going to error. It's going to tell you, hey, I can't do this because dependency conflict. This doesn't work. When it can get a bit worse is what if B says, I need C version 21? Then it depends on your distribution and on your package manager. Maybe it's going to error. And that would be kind of nice for it to error. But maybe it's going to say, OK, I need to install C21. It's newer than the version I have, so why wouldn't I install it? And then it's going to install C21. And then you're going to open the application A, and it's going to crash. And it's not going to work, because now it doesn't have what it needs. So this is one of the main sort of conflicts that you can get into. And um, do you remember last time when we talked about the difference between scheduled releases and rolling releases? So this is generally only going to be a problem on rolling releases. Because last time, I said that on a scheduled release distribution, the maintainers of the distribution can make sure that all of the applications work well together. That's what I said. This is what I meant, basically. The, the distribution managers will make sure that the applications that they ship don't have conflicting dependencies. So this is not a problem you would run into when it comes to Ubuntu. Now, this is what your distro would do, right? When it comes to something like Flatpak, let's say, like an, a universal one, it's going to look at this quite a bit differently. So it's going to do the same thing for A. The difference is when it goes to installing B, it's going to go, I need C at version 21, and it's going to install C21. It's going to have two separate versions of C. That would seem simple, but if you install C, ver if, if C needs C version 20, so that's the same version, it's still going to install C20. That is the thing that allows these universal package managers to be universal. Any app that you install with them will come with their complete dependencies. In real life, this is not that simple. There is some level of deduplication happening on a per file basis, at least with Flatpak. So you're left with a lot of files. Advantage is, because they have the file together with all of the dependencies together, they can encapsulate this a bit. So applications running either in Snap or in Flatpak do not have permissions to interact with your operating system with anything else on your computer by default. So as opposed to a normal application that, same as on Windows, it can do anything, these universal applications have to ask for permission if they want to do anything. If they want to see what files you have in a certain folder, they have to ask for that specifically. If they want to access your webcam, they have to ask for that specifically. So you have sort of this security advantage to it. 
at the disadvantage of maybe usually a little bit of performance because there is a little bit of overhead in sort of making sure everything is secure. So this is a very short overview of the main difference, I would say, between your distribution specific packages and your universal ones and the advantages and disadvantages. There is no right or wrong here. One of them is more efficient on space on the performance. The other one on security and on just working more reliably because you, you can't have broken dependencies or stuff. So now that we know that, we can already kind of install any applications we want and we can choose the source that we want to install it to, right? Now, uh, I don't really have a specific animation to prove this on. What are you guys' favorite uh, Windows applications? What are some apps that you use every day? Yo. No, to the left. Me? Yes. I don't use Windows. Hmm? I don't have Windows. Oh, what do you have? Linux. I love that. Thank you. What applications do you use on Linux every day? That's going to make my job even easier, I guess. Spotify. Okay, so whatever application you want, and this one is going to be available on basically any platform. If we search for Spotify, this is probably going to be available in multiple sources. Searching oh, I'm searching in a specific category. Yeah, sorry, I messed that up. So no, apparently it's only available as a flat hub. So we can again see the same thing of distributed by central repository of flat pack applications. That means it's going to come as a flat pack. What's that going to mean for us? That after we click install, we'll probably wait a little bit <laughs> because again, it's going to install absolutely everything that it needs in order to run Spotify. But any application that you want, on Flatpak, you'll be able to find almost any application you need. If there's an application that you're used to using on Windows that you don't find, first of all, the first attempt, try to find an alternative if you're not like, specifically fond of that application. Try to find an alternative because that's always going to give you the best performance, right? Now, what are our options? if we want to run Windows software. So let's say we want to run a game that is absolutely not going to work on Linux or the Microsoft Office suite, which I said is not available, right? So let me open Kate again. And let's first of all think a bit. Why do Windows applications not work on Linux? They use Windows system calls in their when they were made. Okay. So let yeah, that's a good answer. Let's split the application into three things, right? So there are two things that would determine the compatibility of an application. That would de uh, uh, determine if you can run it or not, right? So first of all, it's gonna be your architecture, and then second of all, the operating system that it's based on, right? So when it comes to architecture, right? Let's say I have a app that is made on, uh, is everyone from my year here? Is everyone from computer science in English? Yeah, okay, so we, are, we did computer architecture with Mr. Chira. So in computer architecture class, we used uh, AMD 64 as an architecture, right? AMD, what did we call it? You call it AX8664, I think, right? Is that what we called it? It's the same thing, there's just multiple names for it. So, let's say I try to run an application that is on X86, that is, no, let's say I, yeah, I want to run an application that is made for this, right, for X8664. My computer is X8632. Why is that not gonna work? Our boss is not big enough. Yeah, so that, an application made for a 64-bit operating system is probably going to contain some 64-bit variables. We literally don't have a way to put those anywhere. Our computer doesn't support that. Now, what if we just have a different architecture? So let's say we have ARM64. ARM is a different architecture, 
but it's still 64-bit. So why wouldn't this work? We don't have the same commands that are used. Yeah, so the instruction set is different. The things that the CPU knows how to do is different. They can do different things, and the things that they both can do may be called different things. So it's like talking to someone in the wrong language. The CPU is just not going to be able to understand you, right? Now, what if both of my computers are on x86-64, right? So both are on the same architecture, but one, I want to run a Windows app, and I'm on Linux. Why is this not going to work? Well, our colleague already said, applications made for Windows are going to use some specific Windows system calls. So an application cannot, for example, create a window. That's not its job. It can't create a window. It has to go to the operating system and say, I want a window. And the operating system is going to give it a window, right? Or if it wants to open a file, it has to go, hey, give me a file explorer. And then after I chose the file, it has to go, okay, now give me that file. All of these are specific to your operating system. It's again, just a language barrier here. If you try to run it on Linux, it's just not gonna understand those commands. Maybe in a lot of cases, Linux can actually do the same thing. So Linux can create you a window and it can open a file explorer and it can open you a file, but those things are gonna be called different things that they would on Windows, right? So it's not going to understand it. Now, we have two solutions to fix this. Let's think a little bit about the diagram that I had last time, that I no longer have as a diagram, so we're going to have text this time. So we said we have some hardware. On top of the hardware, we have a kernel. On top of the kernel, let's now just call it the operating system. So this would be, well, now because that the kernel is part of it. We have the basic utilities that are on top of the kernel, the way I called them last time. I feel like I wrote that wrongly, but that's fine. And then on top of that, we have our program that we want to run, right? So, as I said, as I said, what we have is a communication issue. So in the case of Linux, our utilities like the file manager and stuff and our kernel we'll be able to do a lot of what the Windows alternative is able to do. But the program doesn't know how to talk to it, right? The first way we can get, uh, we can get a Windows application to run is through a compatibility layer. So what we can do is right here before it say, hey, let's put sort of like a, let's call it a translator here, right? So whenever the program is going to ask Windows, make a window for me. Our translator is going to go, OK, he wants a window. I'm now going to ask Linux to create me a window. It's going to translate those, thing out, those things automatically for you. And this is, at this point, this is already going to allow you to run a lot of Windows applications. Even running games, this is the same way it works. And I'll talk a bit about that in a second. But this is the way running games on Linux works as well, Windows games in particular. The advantage of this is there is really not a lot of performance overhead. This works extremely fast because this is just the one-to-one -one translator. It doesn't need to handle a lot of logic. It doesn't need to handle a lot of context or anything. It can just take one request, translate it, send it on. So this is a very, very fast operation to do. The other thing that you can do, if you want, is create a virtual machine. This is something we've talked about near the beginning of the semester. The other way around, actually, we created a Linux virtual machine inside of Windows. But what, what it means to create a virtual machine is to completely replace your hardware with some virtual hardware. So your computer is completely going to emulate a CPU completely in software, almost. And it's going to emulate your GPU, and it's going to emulate some storage. It's going to put it somewhere on real storage. But it's basically going to create some virtual hardware that you can use. This does have a lot of performance impact, because this virtual hardware 
is actually a program. It's simulated. It's a program that is running in your normal operating system. So that means that before this, we have some basic utilities of the operating system that you're running on at its base. And you have the hardware and the kernel of that operating system. So you can see how this would have a lot of performance overhead because now you just have two computers. You have all of the tasks that your normal computer does and then you're telling it to emulate you some new hardware and then on it run an entire new kernel and a new operating system and a new everything. This has a pretty big performance cost. But in this way, because you are completely emulating the hardware from scratch, this is always going to work. And every single Windows application will be able to run like this. Because in this scenario, if you try to look only at this last period, and you don't look at anything that's before it, the Windows, the fake Windows that you're running, is in a lot of cases not even going to know it's virtual hardware. So the only thing that it's going to see is this. It's a full normal operating system. It can do absolutely everything that Windows can. So that would be the second way of running Windows applications in Linux. For most use cases, maybe a little bit overkill because this is a lot of work to do. Now, don't get me wrong, people have worked a lot on optimizing this problem and it's not nearly as bad as I make it sound here, but this is a simplified way of looking at it and it is true that there is a big performance impact. That is true at its core. So, what we're interested in is how can we make this first thing happen? How can we make a compatibility layer happen? I'm not going to talk about virtual machines because, first of all, I already have, and I've made a video about this that I've already sent to everyone. So I've already talked a bit about virtual machines. And also because, as I've mentioned in the previous meeting that we had, this laptop was bought by going from cheapest to most expensive. If I run a virtual machine on it, chances are it will explode. This is not capable of doing all of that. That is a lot of work for this tiny laptop. So, on Linux, we have a very popular compatibility layer called Wine. Because Linux programmers like naming their software in funny ways. So we have Wine. Now, how do we use Wine? That's complicated. Maybe we'll talk a bit about Wine, like how to use Wine directly next time because using Wine does require knowledge of the terminal and of commands and stuff that we haven't gotten into. But we have a little ace up our sleeves, which is Bottles, the software that I searched for at the beginning of this meeting. Bottles is a front end, it's a UI application that is meant to configure Wine. It is a way to be able to use Wine without needing the knowledge of how to use wine. Also, that's why the name, because bottles of wine, Linux programmers. So let's try to see how we get that working. Now, oh, I've installed Spotify. Also, I forgot I did this in the background. Let's see if it works. It would be quite embarrassing if it doesn't work. Though with this laptop, nothing can surprise me, really. We'll give it some time to open, and in the meantime, actually, I don't even know if that launch thing works. Should I just Spotify in here? Oh, that's a, that's, that kind of explains why it doesn't work. There it is. Now that's get Spotify. We're probably having some slight troubles with Spotify, and we'll get back to it in a second. But for now, let's focus our attention on this store manager that is not responding. You're used to Windows. You're used to Windows not responding. Things happen. Let's close it and open it again, as we did many times already. So let's get bottles, because that's what we were trying to do here. Getting bottles is the reason that I wanted to enable Flatpak at the beginning and Flathub, because bottles is only available, is only available through Flathub. So let's quickly install that. 
Now, quickly might be a bit of an overstatement. Bottle sometimes takes a little bit to install. So as we wait, do we have any sort of questions so far? <coughs> as to what my voice is cracking? Yeah, I'll have to look into why Spotify doesn't want to work today. If not, then we'll wait for a little bit for bottles to download. So, as I said, it's going to let us create some wine environments. Um, I'm thinking if I want to go into how wine works. Not really right now. But if we open it, you'll see that we are able to choose, for example, uh, the version of Windows that we want to have compatibility with and stuff like that. An ironic thing that I've had happen in the past is Wine... So you know how older Windows software, especially if you look back to Windows XP... Hands up if you've used Windows XP. That's less than I imagined. What? Embarrassing enough. Yeah. Wait, okay, let's go. What's the oldest Windows you've used? No, 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 uh, Alexia. Seven. Fair enough, Madrina. <laughs> Fair enough, I guess, Tanya. And then the XP, nine. Oh, you used XP. Okay. So, as you might know, Windows XP apps Quite a few of them don't really want to work on Windows 10 anymore, or 11. Windows 10 or 11 don't have the greatest backwards compatibility. Technically, Windows does have a compatibility mode. So on any application that you have, you can like right-click, Properties, Compatibility, and you can choose Run as Windows 7 or Windows XP and stuff. I've had more success running Windows XP apps in bottles than I had in Windows 10. So ironically enough, when bottles, or wine in general, tends to be very good at emulating old Windowses. Better than modern Windowses can emulate old Windowses, which is a little ironic. But in the meantime, bottles has installed. So let's see if this one works. If this one doesn't work either, then I will presume that for reasons unknown, I have to restart my computer. The unknown reasons are actually very well known, which is that you know how on Windows as well, sometimes when you install something, it says that this will require a restart, uh, this will require a reboot. Windows just, uh, Linux just doesn't really tend to say that, but I have installed a lot of new software without rebooting. So this might be it telling me that it's time to reboot. Now, I will ask you to excuse me while I open the terminal, Pref pretend you don't see it because I promised you we're not using the terminal today, but I'm just doing this for a bit of a debug here, okay? Yeah, so that would explain why it's not working. Yeah, I do need, a, I do need to restart my computer. That is a little bit unfortunate because we are recording, but we will stop the recording for a second. And we'll restart the computer and we'll be back to that. So because I installed Flatpak while the computer was obviously still on, it does want to restart a bit. Now, instead of restarting, I could have also logged out and logged back in. It does the same thing. But, uh, but then we wouldn't get to see the blue screen. I thought that's trip bar by Microsoft in this case. Did you know it was added to Linux? But it's from the projector. Oh yeah, no, that's from the projector. But there is a recent... Uh... Yeah, but for those... Okay, so for those that already know some stuff about Linux, there is like a new proposal, or I don't think... I don't know if it's already been pushed into System D, that does introduce a blue screen of death functionality to Linux for critical errors. So no, that's no longer, I guess, just a Microsoft thing. Cool. So now that we're back here, let's also start recording again before I forget. And let's see, do I get my software? Yes, I do. So you, for a second there, you could have seen. Now if we search for Spotify, for example, because that was also from there, we can see that we have it installed. 
So after a quick restart, that works. And if we try to open it, please work. It works. So we have Spotify. Now, I'm not that excited about Spotify because I use YouTube Music, but I am excited about bottles, especially bottles of wine. So if we open this one, we can see that it's going to ask us to wait a little bit again. Because in the background right now, it's configuring wine to actually work. Be glad that it's asking us to wait and not to type funky commands. We're happy to let it just work on its own this time. In the meantime, uh, let's see. So who here uses Windows? OK. Windows app that you use every day. Please don't be a Microsoft app. I, those are harder to get. A non-Microsoft Windows app. OK, but Chrome already works on uh, Linux natively. Steam. Steam works on Linux natively. Any other choices? Yeah, let's go for something simple. Anyone? I could try Minesweeper, but that's a little bit harder to find the executable for, and I don't really want to waste time right now. Uh, anyone here used Notepad++ in the past? A lot of, how have more of you used Notepad++ than Windows XP? How does that happen? Okay, so for those of you that haven't used Notepad++, well, it's a notepad with two pluses. It's a more advanced notepad. It's actually a little less advanced than what I've shown you with Kate, because it doesn't have Git integration and stuff, does it? I don't think it does. No. But it does have stuff like syntax highlighting for programming languages and support for having multiple files open. Notepad does as well in Windows 11, but it didn't use to before that. So let's see how we do that. First of all, let's create a bottle. OK? So I'm going to call this bottle Windows, uh, let's see, let's make it a Windows 10 bottle, right? And we can see we have some presets. We have a preset for application, one for gaming, or custom, which means that we can choose our own options here. Now, what can we choose? The runner. The runner is just going to be the version of Wine that we're using. For now, you really don't need to care about this. For basic applications, all are going to work. But there are Wine versions that are specific for certain tasks, like that do better in certain tasks. So. Uh, who's heard of the Steam Deck? Three people. So you might have heard the Steam Deck runs on Linux. But it can run Windows games, right? Because it can run almost anything that is on Steam. That's because Steam is actually just using Wine behind the scene. They're using their own version, which is called Proton. You might have heard of the name. But Proton is just one of these versions of Wine, the same way that here we're using Soda, because that's non-alcoholic. But it's still just wine. It's the same thing behind the scenes. It's just adapted to be better suited to certain tasks. So in this case, let's just use Soda, yeah, and we can choose between a 64-bit and a 32-bit architecture. Now, keep in mind, this isn't like doing some crazy emulation. So if our computer were 32-bit, I couldn't choose 64-bit here. I can't do magic. But because I have a 64-bit computer, 32-bit just is a subset of that, right? 32-bit applications can run. So I have a choice, but I'll just keep this one. And then I'll keep everything as default, and I'll just keep, click Create. So now it's going to tell us that it's configuring Wine for us. In the meantime, let's find Notepad++, right? So if I open a browser, keep in mind, this time we are basically installing a Windows application. So we don't have package managers or anything like that. We're doing this the Windows way. So we have to look up Notepad++, accept the terms of conditions, go to Downloads, grab the newest version, get consent to whatever this is, get ourselves an installer. OK, and we now have this executable file. So we can't run this executable file on Linux. It's not going to do anything by itself. Now, in this case, because we have Wine installed, notice how it's pretty small, but it does have sort of a Windows logo on it. It does know it's a Windows application, and if we click on it, it is actually going to run without bottles. 
because we have wine installed in our system, it's going to automatically configure wine to a certain extent. extent. But the success rate of that is not great because you don't know how it's going to configure wine. You're usually going to end up with a Windows 7 32-bit, which is not going to run a lot of stuff. So that's why we're making our own wine using bottles. So now we can go into here and we can see we have this run executable. This is where we can actually put our executable. So if we click run executable, uh, yeah, it's going to tell us it's running in a sandbox for security reasons. It's going to tell us that might cause some compatibility issues and that you can disable the sandbox if you need to. For Notepad++, I think it should work anyway. So let's see where it is. Is it in downloads? No, where did it put it? Oh, it is in downloads, but it's looking for a Windows installer package. I'm not really sure why. Let's see, just, oh yeah, no, this is this one. Uh, I'm not really sure why it's looking necessarily for a Windows installer package. So a Windows installer package is a MSI file. If on Windows, when you try to install something, you've noticed like a .msi file. It's similar to an executable, but it's specifically made for installers. Now, if we just get rid of that filter and we go into downloads, I think it should work just this way. Let's try it. So it says launching. Yeah. And now this looks like the Windows one with installing and stuff. So now we can just click OK, go through the same process we would on Windows. So this all works. Now, this is important. When it asks where it's going to install, you've noticed that it says like C program files Notepad++ which is kind of how folders look on Windows. On Windows, you have C program files. If we actually look on my computer here, I don't actually even have a C drive because the main drive on Linux is not called C. That's just the name that Windows gave it. And if we look into my main drive, I don't have any program files. So the, the file structure is different on Linux. This thing here, when it says it's going to install to C program files, that's just a fake folder inside of Wine. So Wine is going to create its own Windows folder. And inside of it, you're going to have the normal file structure that you would have in Windows. So we can click Next. We don't really care to install a lot of these, but we can click Next. I don't think creating a shortcut on the desktop is going to work. I would doubt that. We can give it a shot, but I don't think so. Let's try. And now it's going to install like it would on Windows. And I I think we can even leave run check. Let's see if that works. It did. And this is not Plus Plus for those that are used them. So we've got a Windows application working under Linux. And this works properly. If I want to open a file, well, if I want to open a file, we'll see that by default, uh, if I look, for example, onto my desktop, there's nothing in there. If I look into documents, there's nothing in there. Because again, as I said, this is sort of a fake Windows directory. None of our files are in here. If I want to see where my actual files are, I can go to my computer and I can go to Z. So Z is going to be your Linux in this case. And inside of it, can I make this bigger? I sadly can't zoom into this, so I don't know how well you can see. But these are the, this is the file system on, of, Win, of uh, Linux. So now if you go to Home, and your notes, this is where all of my files would be. As it so happens, I don't have a lot of files in here. And it also, right now, can't see them because of permissions. Remember how I said Flatpak has a permission system that aims to protect our files by not allowing apps to see them by default? We would have to give it permission to see our files. But the application itself works, right? So that's how you, and now that we have it installed, by the way, we can see that if we look into the Windows 10 bottles, now we just have Notepad++. It sees it as an installed program. And now we can just click this, and that's going to open it. It's going to take a quick second to power it on because it is still doing some translation. But once it opens, this is going to work fine. Now, I don't know if we find it in here in our menu. No, so we don't find it in here, but I think we can in some ways. So. Uh, yeah, if we right click on if, if we click on the thing there to the right and we click on add desktop entry 
it's going to open a Flatpak documentation because it's not allowed to because of the security thing is. But if we gave it permission, it would work. Um, as far as how to give permissions, Flatpak has a manager for that. So if we go into our software center again, I think this is going to work. Let's see. We should see an application called Flat Seal. This is a manager for Flatpak, Flatpak applications. So if we install this and launch it, let's see if I've installed it properly. Yeah, so you see how in this manager, we have bottles and Spotify because we've installed the two of them. And we can see what permissions they have and we can control them. So if we want it, for example, for bottles, let's see. If we go down to file system, for example, if I give it all system files, it's going to be able to actually see the files. They're not going to be hidden anymore. I can actually give it all user files. So that's why when we went into my home, it was empty. Now that I've given it the rights, it should be able to see those as well. And when it comes to creating desktop entries, yeah, well, if you look enough through these, you're probably going to find it somewhere, or it was also probably mentioned in the documentation that it opened up that I did close down, so I don't have that anymore. But if you look in there, you should be able to find it. But let's see, now that we've given it the rights, if we go again into bottles, let's test out if it worked. If we go to our Windows 10, or by the way, you can also just go to library. Oh no, if you add it. If we go to Notepad++ and we go add to library, now we don't need to go inside of here anymore. We can just go to the library and we can see that it's here and you'll have all of your applications here. So we can launch Notepad++. Let's see, maybe now because we have file access, maybe now we can actually create a desktop entry as well. I'm not sure. So that's still a no. We're still not allowed to do that. There would be some more settings to do. But now let's see if the thing worked. If we open um, computer Z home your notes. So now we see all of my files. Now we see desktop documents, downs, etc. So this was a nice demo, I guess, of the way security works in Flatpak. You need to enable permissions yourself in order for you to actually be able to see your files and anything. Okay. So. I think we've covered the main three points that we wanted to cover. We've used the KDE apps, we've installed some new apps, and we've talked about how to get Windows apps working. Are there any questions? Do you know any apps that Wine doesn't work with? Oh yeah, Oh, so let's talk a bit about that. Uh, a great way to check that is if you look online, there are two things. So if you're looking for games specifically, Windows has a thing called the Proton DB. A Steam has a thing, sorry. And if you look on the Proton DB, you can search for any game you want. So for example, let's say I want to play some Elite Dangerous. And it's going to tell me that the compatibility is gold. So gold would mean that it runs perfect after some tweaks. You need to work a little bit of it. The biggest grading that it can get is platinum. Platinum just means that out of the box, the game is perfectly going to work as it would on Windows. Gold is generally speaking, going to mean 99% fine. It's going to mean that maybe a font doesn't load or something like that, like some minor inconvenience. Uh, if we look, if we want to know for apps in general, Wine has the same thing. If we look on Wine, we can search for WineDB and we have the Wine application database. And now in here, one thing that I can tell you doesn't really work is Adobe apps. So if I want to look for After Effects, Uh, how did that search? Oh yeah, wait, it searched in the Wine HQ. I want to search in the AppDB at the top here. Okay, so in here I want to search for After Effects, yes. It's still searching the main thing. How do I search in the AppDB? I'm getting confused. Browse apps? Yeah, browse apps, sure. So now I can look by name and I can go After Effects. And we can see it. And if we click on it, we have all of the different versions of After Effects. And we can see that the compatibility is, at best, some 
very old version of After Effects from 2004 had gold compatibility. Anything more recent is garbage. Garbage is such a low rating that it means it doesn't even start, if I remember correctly. So uh, somewhere there's a page of like what each rating means. If I know correctly, bronze means that it starts, but that's like about it. Doesn't do a whole lot, just starts. Garbage just means it does nothing. So that's not gonna work. So there are like, wine is a great tool for certain cases. It's especially gonna work really well with like simpler apps, but the more an app really wants to integrate with Windows and use the advanced Windows features, those are not gonna be able to really translate well to Linux. So yeah, there are definitely limits. When it comes to games, it actually works surprisingly well though, because uh, yeah, well, it tends to be that most games use the same, like a couple of technologies, and those technologies have mostly been translated to Linux. So for games, it's a lot of games can run. For general purpose applications, a lot of simple stuff will run. A lot of stuff that doesn't run on Windows anymore will still run in here because it's older Windows apps. But some modern Windows apps and advanced Windows apps are not going to work. There are limits. And in that case, that's where you get to a virtual machine. In fact, uh, Linux is really great at doing virtual machines. So, uh, Lightweight, not just because it's lightweight, it has a lot of specific features to that. I can't go right now into exactly how those work, but the emulation of the CPU is very, very, very good on Linux. And especially one feature that Linux can do that Windows cannot do for gaming specifically, it's called GPU pass-through. So if you create a virtual machine in Linux, especially if you have two GPUs in your computer, you can tell Linux to fully disconnect one of your GPUs and connect it directly to the virtual machine. So the virtual machine has a fully physical, non-virtualized GPU, which is an insane performance boost. So when you go to that point, Win Linux is way better than uh, Windows for running virtual machines. And as much as I joked about this computer not being able to run virtual machines, I did run virtual machines even on it. It may even work better than Windows in some cases, like native Windows installations is only the application itself uses the, uh, the graphics card instead of well, when you run a game and Windows. Well, when you run a virtual machine in Linux, you're running a full Linux. You're running a full Windows, and you're giving that entire Windows your GPU. So no, it's the same thing. You're still going through Windows. Yeah, that's not necessarily a, an advantage. But uh, yeah, the general performance idea of Linux being more lightweight is correct. If a game is supported on both platforms, it will almost always work better on Linux. And if a game works on Linux through a translation layer, so through Proton or something, it is a lot of times going to work better than it would natively on Windows. Because yes, Windows does a lot of things in the background that end up slowing down your computer. Linux just has way less stuff in the background. So even with that slight performance overhead of translating, it's still a net positive at the end of the day in quite a few cases. So yeah, Linux being more performant even for gaming is generally a correct thing. But virtual machines, no. An emulated Windows is not gonna run better than a bare Windows ever. Okay, if you have no other questions, then that was it for today. Thank you. <laughs>